So Lorraine, I've got a new nickname I've been given by the teenagers, a new family nickname. I don't like people giving you nicknames <laughs> that don't originate from me. What is your new family nickname? Well, I was slightly nervous at first, but uh, my son started calling me MVP, MVP. And I thought, what, what oh. is that? Is that, is that minimum viable podcaster? <laughs> We're well, barely actually, viable, Trish. We, we are, are quite viable. little. Actually, no, it's really good. Most valuable player. I'm the what? MVP in our family. And that comes from, I think it's That's a Euros, a, a, Euro Euro footy, a Euro footy saying about who on the team is the MVP. And so Kit decided that I was the MVP in our family. So I'm very happy with that one. So I can be MVP any day you like. What do you I think? like it. I, um, I'm going to crochet you a little badge <laughs> like Tom Daly, the diver, and his yes. crocheting. I'm going to crochet like you an MVP. Very Minimum good. viable podcast. I'm the most valuable person. <laughs> Player. That's it. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome to Postcards from Midlife. I'm Lorraine Candy. I'm Trish Halpin, and we're on a mission to help you make the most of your magnificent midlife. We'll be tackling everything from mind and body wellness to HRT and your sex drive. Lorraine and I are here to help you have a stylish second act and answer all your midlife questions on fashion, beauty, careers, relationships, family, and as always, the challenges and joys of parenting teens. Welcome back from your holidays on the love boat, Captain Trish. How was your week sailing around the Greek islands? Well, it was brilliant. Well, brilliant when we got there, which I didn't actually think would happen. (laughs) It was a bit complicated. It was. Oh my god! I I booked it like way over a year ago. I've been saving like mad, really looking forward to it. And we thought, well, we're going to go for it because we can with all the rules and regulations. But the gazillion COVID tests and government forms. I mean, I honestly. (laughs) <laughs> didn't think it would happen uh, as we'd get something wrong and be turned away from the airport or one of the teams would catch mm. covid oh and we'd be stuck in an airport hotel for for 10 days the stress of it all nearly did for me but i have to say it was it was amazing it was absolutely fabulous well you are susceptible to that kind of stress it doesn't really <laughs> surprise me because you will be that person who's checked the paperwork <laughs> 25 million times formulated plan a b and c had air ambulance on standby i'm just exhausted of thinking about how you think about things Mm. Um, it's a lot of overthinking which you know what i've noticed in quite a few of my friends which seems to peak in midlife because we have a lot to do in midlife so i thought uh we should tackle this overthinking Mm. situation um, and our uber planning the uber planning of trish on the show later on and help relieve you of the stress of it in future yes so i'm looking forward to that because that's coming up in how to win at midlife so any of you other overthinkers like me out there do keep listening for that section which comes just after our guest interview with the fabulous Nadia Narain a yoga teacher and meditation expert who managed to change your mind about yoga and self-care didn't she Lorraine and I mean we all know how stubborn you are she had me omming Trish can you imagine (laughs) never seen the like Uh, Anyway, Nadia is going through a really interesting midlife journey herself right now. She's found love again. Um, She's in her late 40s and she's involved in helping parent teenage boys, which, you know, all of it, I think, will really resonate because this show is about women's stories in midlife. And I think this is a particularly helpful one, given that she is a self-care expert Mm -hmm. as well. Mm, well, I can't wait to to meet Nadia, your other good friend. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm jealous. <laughs> She's I'm not, not jealous. an overthinker. <laughs> <laughs> but first up, though, we are sticking with the holiday theme to discuss the dynamics of holidaying with friends and extended family, as well as the etiquette of when other families invite your darling son or daughter on holiday with them. I wish someone would invite my lot on holiday with them so I could go on holiday with myself <laughs> or maybe invite me on holiday with them. <laughs> And leave, nice, them, leave the family with James. Yes. Yes, nice. Now, Trish, when we head off into the distance in our giant RV, road vehicle, that means, mm-hmm. with the number of plates bats out of hell, see what I did there? <laughs> I think we would rub along okay as holiday mm. mates. I think we'd be fine as long as it was just the two of us. But I think I'd be a little bit more concerned if we went on holiday with our actual families. Oh, my goodness, especially all crammed together in an RV. Can you imagine? <laughs> 
<laughs> neither of us would be allowed to stack the dishwasher and no. the men probably come to blows over they would have a who stacks the dishwasher best competition yeah. Uh, but yes holidaying with other families it's it's brilliant but it's also a bit of a minefield and it is that time of the year up it's august we thought we'd tackle the rules of co-holidaying as they call it i think most of us probably spent a lot of trips with the other families when the kids were toddlers or babies um just <laughs> Just so we could take it in turns yes. to baby it. And oh my God, one of you has to get up early and one of you doesn't, all of that. Um, but it gets a bit more troublesome as the kids get older. Yes, you know, um, we've never had problems in our group holidays because we've decided very early on with friends that we would abide by some very simple rules on holidays, mm-hmm. that we would only go away if we had the same attitude to booze, food, cash, and disciplining mm. wayward offspring. If every box is ticked there and you're going to do a so you could even questionnaire it with the people yeah. with the holiday with <laughs> yeah, do best, poll. exactly yeah. our best trips actually have been with a family we met at nursery when our children were very small mm-hmm. um, and six weeks later we all went away together oh, wow. um, oh, we hardly knew them but we knew they were flexible and they had a really relaxed attitude to, to parenting there was no kind of everyone has to be in bed by a certain time you know food is at a certain time we knew that that wasn't really going to work I've always avoided I mean there are some great friends of ours that we can't simply can't holiday Mm -hmm. with families because they're much more rigid about you know Closing. And have you had that conversation with them, or is it just yes. it just doesn't? Yeah, just say it's not going to yeah. work. Yeah, we've had yeah. a couple of times where we said we just this kind of wouldn't work because you like a scheduled activity. Yeah, yeah so that's okay. At a certain time, yeah. so it's okay. I think. I mean, how has it worked for you? What we found works best, and we've just done this on the sailing holiday, is actually we go with other people, but we have separate accommodation. I think that works really well. So we went with another lovely family, dear dear friends of ours. They had their boat with their kids. We had our boat with our kids, and we were just sailing around the Ionian. And similarly. Um, you know, <laughs> I think I've mentioned our little trip to Suffolk, this little Suffolk village where loads of us descend, but we all have different houses. The kids are in and out of the houses. We're in and out of each other's house. And it's just brilliant. I just think there's that thing of when you get up in the morning and you're in your PJs and you're yeah. a bit grumpy because you haven't had your coffee. You know, it's just, I, you know, I don't want to voice that on other people, shall we no, say. I don't mind seeing it, Trish, in our <laughs> in RV, in our camper PJs. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit like Christmas, isn't it? These are my thoughts on it you've got to keep your expectations quite low so there's no disappointment as well I think you've got to sort of manage that and I think it's boring and useful to plan in advance Mm. I know that's that's something you do all the time and you know what when I've done trips with my girlfriends Mm. um we we use a cash sharing app where we just put all the stuff in it it. yeah Yeah, and then you just whoever buys it buys it and then you say this is the cost and then you take a picture of the um receipt and it Mm. all goes in and at the end somebody's in control of it and they just say right everybody owes this and then you don't have to worry about stuff being divided up when we do staycations with families and we often get the same house we do a little rota of who does the food Mm -hmm. the washing and the shopping and then there is this lovely thing that people can do called the one parent rule so if you're all staying together and there's lots of families one of the parents takes a day so what however the day goes it's that parent's rule so you know it might be dads who like you can go to bed in your clothes and wear them the next day always seems to happen with our children when James is in charge they go to bed in their clothes they get up and they've got they've had them on for three days yeah so. yeah and then you abandon all than all your normal rules to allow for that mm-hmm. um, also my my friend Pete likes to take a nap in the afternoon oh, <laughs> on okay. a family holiday he just yeah. says I just need to go for my nap and I know that means he's really had enough now of all of us and he just <laughs> yes. needs a bit of a break yeah and always to remember that your best friends aren't necessarily your best parent friends so make yeah. that yeah 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 so it's a bit about being a bit more relaxed and chilled out about everything and but there are then this sort of extended family and multi-generational yes. family holidays so that is you know obviously Tricky. those rules and tips and advice that you've given probably apply there but there are friends. also other dynamics going on aren't there because I do think you have to be even more tolerant and chilled on an actual uh you know your extended family holiday because you can end up falling into roles you know from childhood like Christmas like Christmas all of that sort of thing so I actually go away with my sister and our daughters and our doggies it's called a girls and hounds trip and we do sort of end up (laughs) what girls and hounds girls and hounds we do a little trip and you know I have to stop myself well we're going to talk about this in a minute my overthinking my pre-planning my I've got everything organized and and she doesn't and I would get a 
annoyed about it because she's my sister. If it was a friend, I probably wouldn't have done, you know. Yeah. So I had to kind of that dynamics of family dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you've got a bossy mother-in-law, if you've got a whatever, you know, you just need to kind of think ahead. If you can sort of take yourself out of it and think, well, this is how the dynamics are going to play out. You'll be more prepared for it and you'll be more yeah. tolerant of it. But there's some really good advice on the Lonely Planet website for planning ahead for multi-generational yes. family holidays. So do take a look on that. But another it's about needs isn't it are my needs going to be met and I often think that is particularly with an older generation they're very worried their needs won't be met and that their change of habitat will mean a change in everything and then they won't be valued in that place so it's just if if you know what their needs are as well you can make sure you have the right tea bags and all the (laughs) yes I'm not speaking about any kind of mother-in-law there (laughs) Let's not go there. No. Now, another holiday hotspot. And I think I'm going to ask you to get your agony aunt hat on for this Oh, one. do it. Do it. I'm no ready. Like pushing that one up. So this has come up a few times on our Facebook group. And it's when your child is invited by another family on their holiday. So what do you make of this, Lorraine, on the Facebook group? My 15-year-old daughter was invited on a five-day break with her best friend by her best friend's parents. Great, we said. Let us know if we can contribute, as you do. No mention of any uh, contribution at this point. She had a great time, was indulged with nice hotels and meals. And we thought, how generous of them. She's been back a few days and I'm about to send a large bouquet of flowers as a thank you. Then this morning we get a text asking for £460. Mm, That's the cost of a whole holiday. It's for the cost of hotel rooms. What to do? What to do, Lorraine? Honestly, you know, this is where the people have both misinterpreted. Because when you send a text saying, let us know if we can contribute, you're Mm. sort of saying, we are prepared to contribute, aren't Mm. you? That's your first mistake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But if you don't get a response, I think you kind of have to follow it up and say, can we be clear about this? Because it looks like a really lovely holiday. But I think it's therefore... You might say they're asking in retrospect, and this wasn't made clear, but you've sort of asked them if you can contribute. So you Mm. kind of asked saying you you are. So I think you go back and say, listen, I really wasn't expecting it to be that Mm. much. Is there any way we could reduce the cost somehow, perhaps to do something else in return later, or perhaps she can come on holiday with us? I think that's an awful lot of money, but that's Mm. miscommunication. So really... All these things have to be discussed in advance. You know, it's like I say about the rotor and the food and all of that kind of thing and how bills are going to be split. It's just misunderstanding. I mean, I was slightly outraged by the price, but I don't think either side is actually in the wrong there. That's one of those you're just going to have to chalk up, possibly pay up as well. What do you think? I think it's a phone call. It's not not something to be done over text. And I'm sure I'd be sitting there freshing and worrying about it. So I think it's just better to get on the phone and just establish. And there could be a bit of, as you say, a bit of compromise on, on both sides. Tricky one, but obviously it's not something you can worry about too much in retrospect you've just got to as you say get ahead of something like that Mm. well we've got four so three teenagers and then one of my teenagers is actually bringing four of her friends on holiday (laughs) in a few weeks time I don't know how I agreed to it I got confused with all their names and then by the time I'd added it up I realized there were four of them not one of them called lots of different nicknames (laughs) will you be paying for them all for like lunches in the pub and well what we've said is can they bring some spending money which I what I do is I, I form a group chat with the parents yeah. So I get everyone's numbers and I say, right, this is, this is, you know, we've got all four of them. It's going to be great. Can you cover the train fares and things like that down and the taxi from the station, all of that? And these are the expectations. It's not super luxury where yeah. we are. And I'm a terrible cook. So, you know, if they've got special food they have to eat, they have to bring that themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's real, we always say this is a go with the flow, mm. rough and ready, take us as you find us holiday. And um, mm. I also, do you know what I've also started to do? And this is so tiny a detail but I think mm. actually makes a real difference it's like bring your own towels and stuff oh yes definitely. because the girls get really upset if people touch their things and it causes little I think makes them kind of fractious from things and it makes them feel a bit more cherished and valued if they've done it but it is and I'm not an overplanner or everything but it is best to do it with the parents in advance even at yeah. 17 18 yeah I think. yeah just thinking ahead well I hope that advice will help you have a happy hassle-free holiday this summer uh, where you don't end up being the chief skivvy and bottle washer <laughs> or UN peacekeeping force yeah well I'm not very good at peacekeeping as you know Trish <laughs> I'm good at saying things loudly that I think out loud and we have to do that for the rest of the year so you don't want to do it on holiday no. do you? <laughs> 
today's guest on Postcards from Midlife is here to help us chat through a subject which Trish and I know many of you start to question when you hit midlife, and that is finding and loving a new identity. We experience and witness so much change at this stage of life as our children leave home, our relationships and careers shift, our minds and bodies reset, that many of us begin to wonder who we are. So let's meet yoga and meditation teacher Nadia Narain. She was one of the original teachers at the legendary Tri Yoga Studio and is now a wellness author who has written three best-selling books with her sister Katia, including Self-Care for the Real World. After growing up in Hong Kong, Nadia left home at 15 to travel and landed in London at 23, where she gathered an impressive list of VIP clients, including Kate Moss, Rachel Weiss, Reese Witherspoon, and even the Arsenal football team. Now 48, Nadia has made some significant changes in her life, giving her a new perspective on how we live now, which could help you reframe your midlife adventures. So welcome to Postcards from Midlife, Nadia. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, Fish. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm going to start by telling everyone that we are great friends. I have mentioned you on the podcast before because I was writing a piece about yoga for the Sunday Times. I was a yoga denier and I came to see you because I just couldn't see the point of yoga and what benefit it would be to anyone. And you very patiently explained it to me. And then over the last sort of three years, have completely changed my life. I love yoga. I think it's probably worth starting by telling our guests about your journey and your career and where you come from. I started when I was quite young and I went to a yoga class when I was 18 years old. A friend took me to one and I didn't see the point of it then, but I went and I just had this, it's so corny, but I had a deeply profound experience where I just wasn't fighting with myself anymore for the first time in a really long time. And so I just kept going back to this class over and over and over again. And then I went on a teacher training when I was about 22, not to become a teacher, but just to like dive into it. And then the next thing you know, I was 23 and starting to teach yoga. And now it's 25 years later. Weren't you sent on the road with a band to teach yoga? (laughs) Because they wanted to do it every day in LA. I've been on tour with a couple of bands, but I was young then and I didn't know you know, what that really entailed. But I would be sitting in my hotel room just looking at yoga books and coming up with routines for them to do. And so it was really good practice, actually. And you started at Tri Yoga, didn't you? And you've been part of that. Ago, yeah, when we first opened, I was teaching there. I'd been teaching a little bit before that, but we opened 20 years ago. And I was part of that. But now that has changed. <laughs> Working with people like Lorraine, who are yoga deniers, what kind of transformations do you see in people? What are the stories really of your clients that have really amazed you? I mean, Lorraine was one that really amazed me. Yeah, I don't really know what happened, but you kind of came once and then you just kept asking if you could keep coming. (laughs) And then it made I, me feel really happy. It was weird. <laughs> and I also, I remember saying to you, because I think you came for a private for the piece, but I said you had to come to class and you really didn't want to come to class. No, I didn't want to roll around in my you know, Louis lemon You didn't want to be in, uh, around other people. That you know, Something just happened. And I think it's such an experiential thing I think they commit to it they start breathing they start to feel better I remember there was one guy that I taught every day for eight years and I went to him for his first private and he was going through quite a difficult time in his life and he was like oh yes I you know I want you and and I got there and he didn't know his right hand from his left hand bit like you Lorraine (laughs) (laughs) you know I'd say lift your right leg and he'd kind of like look at me not really knowing how to do that and I left and I thought oh well that's it he's not gonna want this again and he texted straight away and he's like can you come back tomorrow that was it and he just kept asking me to come back because I think for the first time he started to breathe in a different Mm -hmm. way and he felt that relaxation at the end which he's never really been able to have you know people just exhaust themselves and then they fall asleep if they even fall asleep And he just felt different in his body. And then the way he describes it, I suppose he says, you get three for the price of one. You're doing body, mind and spirit all Mm -hmm. at the same time. 
I think that's one of the things that happens is that when you exercise, you just sort of think about this physical strength that you're building or you're trying to get a six pack or this endorphin rush. But with the yoga, you really go into this quiet space within yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's accumulative. Each time you do it, you feel it a little bit more. Mm. And I, I think I can only describe it as, you know, it's like you're getting to know yourself without all the distractions. I think that's really interesting for midlife because we were talking earlier actually about the fact that midlife is a time where you often start trying to find out who you are at this stage in your life, who you're going to be, reassess your values, reassess your purpose. And yoga is a, is a really good tool to kind of help you get into that for the reasons that you said. But you yourself in midlife, you've reached a point where you're making some quite big changes as well. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I sort of did it the other way way around I was just short of 16 when I left home and I had a really difficult relationship with my mum so I just got really lucky I could earn a living so I just went all right I'm out and and then I got into yoga from my own pain and heartbreak and you know heartbreak from my family heartbreak in relationships so I asked all those questions then and then all of a sudden in this COVID madness I fell in love after years and years of just kind of resign. Part of it was like I'd resign myself to I'm not good at this relationship business. Mm -hmm. And it was exhausting me. Like I just wasn't having fun anymore. And I just said to myself, you know, I, I have a great life. I have amazing friends. I have a great career. And I just started to enjoy my life without looking for a relationship anymore I was like I thought I, I kind of got my shit together in every other part of my life apart from the so maybe that's just not my journey mm. and I really had found happiness you know I was just super super content and then all of a sudden I sort of fell into this thing and I was like oh god I was really just enjoying myself on my <laughs> <laughs> but he's not in this country so it's slightly complicated you had to make you had to make some quite big decisions didn't you based on yeah. having decided to be one way and then now you yeah, know life I, had thrown it, this curveball at you pretty much every single part of my life changed my relationship status changed my um the country where I'm going to spend a lot of my time changed. I went from being really happy with not having children, being on my own to a man with two kids and a very close relationship with his ex-wife because they co-parent really well together. And then suddenly I'm like cooking dinner and sitting down at a table at 6.30 and I was like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> A time in your life where I really feel like women actually enjoy time to themselves a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, so I've had all this time to myself and suddenly I was flung into this whole situation. And it was really interesting because I didn't expect to battle with it as much as I did. You know, I really missed my alone time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't actually realize what an introvert I was until I got together with a guy that was a total extrovert and thrived on people. And I thought I was quite extroverted because I taught all these people, but then I came home to my quiet flat. <laughs> you know? yeah. And so I had to sort of find my way a little bit. And the great thing about getting into a relationship when you're older, I think, is that you know who you are a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so I would see myself losing bits of me and then I would be able to pull myself back and go, actually, I need time to myself. I need to take myself out of the situation a little bit. Um, we built a little shed so that I had my own space <laughs> to enclose the door like that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get one of them for Trish. <laughs> <laughs> All these things that I took for granted, being single and having my own space, I suddenly realized all these women that had been telling me, like, I just don't have time. And I was like, oh, I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> 
for all those women listening in who are wanting that space, how do you ask for that from other people? Because at the beginning of a relationship as well, we're all a bit nervous, aren't we? I guess we are a bit nervous. I mean, I've been in a relationship for 20 million years now. But what did you learn that we can pass on to listeners about asking for what you need? Well, first of all, I've been in therapy for many, many years. You know, there were things that I was battling with. I'm like supposed to be so happy and in love and this is supposed to be the great thing. And at the same time, I was like having panic attacks that I didn't have alone time. So I'd write these things down and I'd talk to my therapist about it. And she would just explain it back to me in such a simple way. And she's like, you have to be honest, you have to communicate. And I got to a place, I think in every other relationship, they were sort of unhealthy. I sort of always longed to be myself the way that I was with my girlfriends, but in a relationship. You know, Mm -hmm. that's what I'd always wish for, but it never seemed to be the way. Mm -hmm. So for this relationship, I really felt that. I really felt like I could be myself. And if I couldn't be myself, I really didn't want to be in it. And part of that was learning to, you know, in a nice way, not without putting him on the defensive or without making him feel like there was anything wrong, just be able to ask for the things that I needed, Mm. you know, and then that gave him space to do the same thing back. And can I ask about the other dynamic in this new relationship? Because a lot of people entering relationships in midlife, there probably most likely will be children involved. So you are now technically, do you think of yourself as a stepmother to these two children? How, how is that relationship? My nature is to nurture. That's mm-hmm. just who I am in my job. And I don't have kids myself. And I made total peace with that before getting into this relationship. Mm-hmm. There was quite a few years of struggle with that I kind of made peace with it I'm like I'm so blessed in so many areas of my life and that bit didn't happen and it's okay it doesn't define me as a woman I feel Mm -hmm. very confident but I love kids I love babies you know you do a lot of birthing yoga don't you you've been at the birth of many kids I've been at 20 births I was at the birth of many of my godchildren and my two nephews I love teaching pregnant women to connect. And that was probably because my mother lost a baby before me. And she, you know, she was a year old when she died. And so there was this mm. disconnect between my mom and I. And so it was really important to me to teach women to connect to their babies. And then it was ironic that I never had them because I thought I'd have five of them. I've been in a relationship before where my ex had had a daughter. I was about eight when I came into the scene and she's 25 now and we're still super close. And I have so many beautiful young people around me that are now young adults that are my godchildren. And just- it's easier to be a slightly separate sometimes then. So you're learning, I you're getting to know the boys at the same time as being yeah, yourself. I, think it is. I mean, they've been amazing. I was really difficult with my my parents, boyfriend yeah. and different people. And they've just made it super easy for me. I don't try and parent. They have parents. So, and I don't try and be really cool because <laughs> not really interested in being my friend. And I just try and be respectful of their family life and their relationship. And, you know, one of the things that I find so attractive is that my boyfriend it's so weird it's weird (laughs) nearly 50 to say your boyfriend but you know he is a real hands-on close father to his kids and he loves that relationship so I respect that I let him take as much time as he needed to introduce me I didn't feel insecure about how much time that took I don't feel insecure around it And so I think it's just made it super easy for them and super easy for us. Is it something you imagined you would have as you head towards 50? I had really given up on relationship, you know, so Mm -hmm. I didn't imagine it. I had no role models in functional relationship between my parents were totally dysfunctional with each Mm -hmm. other. They didn't even speak for about 20 years and they were totally dysfunctional with each other's partners Mm -hmm. and so I had no role model all I did know as I got older was I don't want any drama in my life 
Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to start drama. I don't want to be part of other people's drama. I have worked really hard to get to a place where I just have nice relationships with mm. people. I like this idea of you choosing not to have drama. Do you think it's a choice that you can make? It's an active, conscious choice you can make in your life. Totally. I, I grew up in full-blown drama, whether it was bad moods or volatile or any kind of drama you could have I grew up with it and so I think you become a bit addicted to it in a way Mm -hmm. because you recognize that if your parents demonstrate that as as love you just gravitate towards it not so much in my female relationships but definitely in my love relationships it was like the more dramatic the more Mm -hmm. in love I was And I don't know what happened in my kind of early 40s. I just made a decision. I mean, made it, I say I just made a decision. I'm in therapy, you know. Mm. So in therapy, I'd made a decision. It was a waste of energy and I wasn't interested in that anymore. Mm. And it means you're prepared to walk away from things that you just think you can just quite, you just make the decision. I'm walking away from this because it's. It doesn't just, serve me. It just does not serve me anymore. And I and I remember being in this really crazy situation with a guy that was much younger than I. I mean, it was insane, the whole thing. And I remember crying in therapy. And, and I was like, when am I going to be done with feeling like this? And she just went, you'll be done when you're done. And that was it. And that was like the most profound thing anyone had ever said to me and it felt like I was able to take control again Mm -hmm. and I was like oh that's it I'll be done when I'm done and now I'm done. (laughs) One of the things you say in your books that you wrote with Katia is that staying soft not Mm -hmm. strong is a really great mantra for life for particularly midlife because we've been taught as Gen X women we have to stay strong we have to be able to do it all we have to have it all we have to be able to look after everybody how does one with your self-care hat on how does a woman in midlife start to be softer and not have to stay strong anymore I think being honest and being vulnerable and all those key things asking for help but one of the things that I've come to realize and and I could be totally wrong this is just how it feels within me I had this amazing career or I I think I still have quite an amazing career but then I got into this relationship and I felt like something had to give a little bit I definitely didn't have the energy to give other people in the way that I was giving and give in this relationship in the way that I really wanted to give. And that that suddenly there were kids and there was an ex-wife and there were his friends. There was a lot to manage. I battled with that a lot because I was like, why do I have to give something up? And then I realized women do it all the time. You know, they have kids, they take some time off work. If they don't, they end up having this battle within themselves. And I don't know if we can have it all at the same time. If I didn't let some of my work stuff go, I probably would have been more reactive in the relationship than responsive in the relationship. And you did give up quite a lot, didn't you? I mean, over the last year, you walked away from the teaching. You, you, I mean, it was quite a big change in midlife for you. And you gave it up, I guess, for love. It was difficult because I had to go somewhere else. So yeah. if I'd been in London, that may not have happened in quite the same way. But weirdly, all at the same time, two of my very high profile clients that I was teaching every day, they sort of disappeared in COVID. You know, one moved to the country, one moved elsewhere. And they were people that I, as much as I would in a relationship, I was showing up every day for them. And they phoned me and they were like, well, you know, things have changed for us and we're off. And so this sort of door opened for me to walk through everything had changed in yoga classes. We were in lockdown. I wasn't teaching classes in the capacity. All this responsibility I had to other people suddenly left. I don't know if I would have been as courageous if COVID hadn't happened. And I probably would have gone, oh, I'll stay for two weeks and I've got to get back to work. But that wasn't it. And again, I was in therapy. So I didn't make 
rash decisions like oh, I'm leaving everything and <laughs> falling in love. I had someone that I spoke to every single week because it was really important to me to not be in some kind of crazy fantasy relationship. Your teaching is fairly interactive. Have you taught a lot of midlife women who've discovered yoga going through changes? Because Catelyn Moran talked to us about it. We've had several guests talk about how they found yoga. What are you hearing back from the women that you encounter? I think as women move through changes in their life, because at another point in their lives where they really shift to yoga is during their pregnancies. Yeah. So they come in in their pregnancies, then they have no time for themselves because they're raising kids. And then suddenly they'll come back again when kids are a little more independent and they're in their 40s and they're in their 50s and they're going through all their changes. So I think it's a it's a beautiful practice in any kind of transition in your life because there's a lot of discomfort in yoga, whether that's in yeah. your body or your mind's going crazy so you're learning to sort of sit with things as they are and you're learning to breathe into them you've got someone kind of prompting you to just hmm, let's sit with the discomfort a little bit and Mm -hmm. see how that feels and you're kind of getting friendly with things without them being this high endorphin rush there's something about yoga and transitions that Mm -hmm. I think feels good in midlife as well of course we're sort of late 40s early 50s we're all facing the aging process that's a relationship as well that we have to possibly sit with and maybe feel uncomfortable with you're a former model you've stayed so healthy over the years what's your kind of thoughts and views and approach to the aging process I am so excited about it I mean there are things like Lorraine and I talked about the other day I'm just getting comfortable now with my my gray hair showing in a way that I would never have done before. You know, I would have raced to the salon every two weeks for no one to know. And I remember sitting down with my boyfriend and going, all right, babe, I've got to just come clean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm really gray. And he's like, no, you're not. I'm like, no, I'm not because you don't see it because I go and do it all the time. But I'm not ready to totally let it go. I'm just trying to relax into it a little bit more. Of course, there are certain things that I get like, oh, God, my jowls or my frown line. Or, but I love the way I feel at this age in a way that I never imagined I would love. I never had a role. I mean, my mother was in total fear of getting older. You know, she had a facelift when she was young. You know, there were so many things that she did because of not enjoying it. Mm. So I had rebelled against that anyway. I just love the confidence that I have on the inside. And if that's the trade-off for not looking Mm -hmm. how I did, yeah. Full collagen and really good skin, I'll take it any day of the week. Mm -hmm. But I'm not one of those women that like loves all her lines and loves her gray hair. I'm just getting friendlier with Mm. it. And how has midlife perimenopause, how has that affected you as someone kind of with your wellness hat on? I've been pretty lucky. I haven't had a period for eight months, so I'm guessing that I'm in menopause. Um, Mm And there was lots of things when you start a relationship and you're starting menopause, <laughs> it's like a bit weird because there's lots of things that you're discovering about your own body changing. And at the same time, you're in this the throes of, you know, like a good sex life or whatever it is. Yeah. And so what I did find, the few things that I felt ashamed about, I tried to hide. And then when I finally was like got brave enough just to be honest it just totally broke the ice and we could talk about things in a way that I feel so comfortable with and it was great because I can say things to him like you know babe my hormones are changing and so it's nothing personal it's just what's going on and Mm -hmm. he totally gets that and I think shame around getting older and shame around menopause and shame around all the changes that are happening I think that's when it gets really difficult for a woman 
Mm -hmm. if you can be honest and talk about it, talk about it with your girlfriend. I mean, you don't have to reveal everything to your partner because I don't think they Mm. should know everything. But the less shame we have about it, the easier it is. I haven't really had too many symptoms, but I also notice that when I'm stressed, those symptoms do reveal themselves. Yeah, so keeping the stress at bay is a better... Stress at bay is really, really important. Exercising in a different way too. I always only did yoga. Um, and now I have Lee, as you know, and so I try and work out with him once a week. And, and I know I probably should do more with weights and all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff. But at the moment, I'm pretty good. But I'm starting to learn more about it and pay more attention to it. Because you, yeah. you get, it's not something you learn about until you get to it. Yeah, so making adjustments. So the book, which Lorraine mentioned you wrote with your sister, Katia, it's called Self-Care for Self-Isolation. So I think we need some of your top self-care do's and don'ts. Can you share a few with us? Self-Isolation was our third book that we wrote. (laughs) in isolation because we just really wanted people to make the most of that crazy time. We kind of wrote about in self-care for the real world, but making sure that you ate well, making sure that you exercised, making sure that you kept your mind out of those anxious places that it could easily go to, trying to be creative in different ways with yourself and with your family that you may not have had the time to do. And there, there were so many things that when Katia and I look back, things that we'd kind of asked the universe for, like I think Katia said something like, God, I would really love a month where I didn't have to go into the cafe and I could just be at home with my kids and something mm-hmm. for a year of it, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's some very simple breathing things that are really helpful when people are feeling a bit panicky, aren't yeah, there? Yes, the, there's the box breathing that we did in self-care for self, self-isolation. And then Explain that to me. You just inhale for four, hold it for four, exhale for four, and hold it out for four. And that's a really good breathing technique for anxiety. The other breathing that I think we talked about in our first book is just trying to keep an even inhale and exhale for a few rounds, extending the exhale a little bit more, which is very calming and soothing on the nervous system. And if you wanted to start yoga, you were a bit like I was, and you're absolutely against meditation. What do you advise women who might benefit from it to do? Because it's a small thing, isn't it? It's adding small things in. Just keep it short. You know, I think people think an hour of meditation, sitting there with your legs crossed, I can't do it. So try a minute of sitting still. Then add another minute or, you know, set your alarm for five minutes and just see what that looks like. Because what you're trying to do is learn to make friends with yourself and you're learning to see what goes on in your own mind. And so, we, you know, we're always going out looking for friends and wanting to make friends and having these relationships with all these other people. But we don't really get to know ourselves. And Mm -hmm. so just sitting there for a minute, two minutes, five minutes, suddenly it grows, it's 10 minutes, it's, it could be 20 minutes. There's such important, it's such an important time of giving to yourself. It, it doesn't all have to be like super kind of serious and earnest, does it? Because Lorraine tells me that you make yeah. her do dancing and yeah, shaking like in your yoga classes. How does that go down? Uh, well, like nothing it. goes down too well with Lorraine. Um, she likes to complain about all of it but she loves it in the end (laughs) so I had and that was another thing that happened in lockdown I really missed dance Mm. and so suddenly I became there was a guy on Instagram Ryan Heppington and he started to do this free dance class so I put that on then I would play really loud music and do the housework and dance and it is, it's, it's a part of myself that I had lost contact with prior mm-hmm. to lockdown. And I found it again, quietly on my own. Mm-hmm. And then I made it something that I wanted to continue as I came out into the world. And so um, even if it's just three minutes dancing freely in your house to your favorite song, and a good way to start that is just by shaking your body, you know, your arms over your head and start to think about shaking the tension out and then moving your body freely. It just mm-hmm. it feels good and it makes you feel happy. Yeah. It's like a dog shaking off water, isn't it? That's what you said to me. It's just I mean, literally freeing yourself of all those terrible feelings. Don't it do it, is. Trish. <laughs> 
shaking. I, I don't know if you both remember when you had your children, but mm -hmm. women sort of shake a little bit after they've been in labor. And if you see yeah. an animal that's like run from from danger, they shake. So it's actually a really good way of releasing stress from the body. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it takes it out of your system. So you always feel really good. So even if you just did it for a minute or did it for three minutes, when you can release that stress, you're not going to take it out on your family members. Mm -hmm. You're not going to take it out on other people that you work with because you're managing it yourself. Yeah. Oh, I think that's lovely. Well, I think that's a good place to leave it, isn't it? The shaking it off, Trish. Yeah, shake it off. I'll be off doing that in a minute. Fantastic. Yes, you will. I know you will. Oh. Anyway, thank you so much, Nadia, for all of that advice and for telling us your story. You're planning some little online retreats, aren't you? That, I'm, uh, thinking, people can... I'm trying to think of different ways of working, but I have this one. I'd really like to do a four-week course for women mm -hmm. and so we'll incorporate yoga meditation um writing prompts and different things so that just women can gather together and do this sort of thing um mm -hmm. but adding adding bits of yoga and breathing and stuff to it so i'm in the middle of writing that for now and that will be on your website, Nadia uh, Narain. It will be on my website or on Instagram. And then you come to my Monday class, which I've taken off for August, but I'll be back to that in September. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Have a great day. For this week's How to Win at Midlife, we're going to be discussing a little problem that I have, which I am aware of. But Lorraine, you are the first person who's ever actually pointed it out to me in your kind, caring, <laughs> lovely way. Um, so we thought it would be helpful to do a bit of research and see what's going on, didn't we? Yes, we did, because I think it's something a lot of women do in midlife. And I hope we haven't spent too much time researching this, Trish, because the issue here is overthinking. Now, we are good friends. We do have a lot in common um, and we do share a lot of the same opinions and approaches to work, family life, everything. But I've noticed that sometimes you get into quite a pickle um, about things because you are desperately trying to anticipate mm. the outcome of every situation which makes me tense to watch oh, you do it because gosh. there's no way you can possibly anticipate yes. the outcome so talk me through what happens well I do um, and I have to say is it's been really helpful for me with you kind of calling it out when I'm doing it it's, it's actually a bit of a relief because it stops my mind worrying because you're going it's okay we've done enough there's enough you know you've done it all it's fine I think where it stems from is trying to be as organized and prepared as I possibly can be <laughs> for whatever the future Future might hold every situation yes. so whether that is in control of the universe oh, yes i control everything whether that's yeah. i am the mvp after all whether that's yeah. holiday planning you know researching a story for work or a presentation or a talk or planning for the kids or trying to think ahead about social scenarios with friends <laughs> everything i just want to I want everything to be okay and I want everything to be really nice and I want to make people feel special. So yeah. I suppose it is being thoughtful, but it just goes too far, doesn't it? And well, you're not God, I Trish, do. so you can't do all those things, can you? That I would do. be impossible. Yeah, I mean, what do I do when I don't have you on hand to stop? Well, <laughs> I think what's really interesting, I've got a friend who does, is another friend who does mm. exactly the same thing. If she wants to buy something, she will buy something like 20 pairs of them oh. and send 18 pairs back. But this is a distraction, actually. So when I was looking into it, there is a blog actually called Overthinkers Anonymous. Oh. It's quite a big That's problem. Mean. I don't think it's uniquely female, but, you know, we're talking about women. It's got its own Facebook page if you want to go and have a look mm -hmm. at that. It's pretty painful for me to read that there because is it overthinking or is it indecision? So you think you're being decisive, and but you're being very indecisive, actually, yeah. which is probably quite stressful. Overthinking is also known as analysis paralysis. So mm -hmm. psychologists say this is a habit we create to make ourselves feel safe. We think we can think our way into all of the outcomes, and then the situation feels a lot safer when we're going into it. So it's masking fear slightly, mm -hmm. um, which is quite stressful. So the truth is we can't make our feel safe. There's just no way. Way of doing that so maybe a little bit like Nadia was saying we can choose a mantra that would be I have peace in this present 
moment. So once you feel safe in this moment, you feel less fearful about what's coming on ahead at you. This is kind of ruminating and rehearsing and it's catastrophizing. Um, Those are the extreme ends of overthinking because you can't predict the future, but it is the way, they say, of the mind dealing with trauma, unresolved trauma, because the mind is working tirelessly to keep us safe. We know we've talked before about the negative bias the brain has because we think about that ahead of time so that we are safe and then we get stuck in this pattern and we just keep repeating it so the first step trish this is why i am your best guru (laughs) is someone calling it out and you realizing you're doing it yes yes (laughs) because then you can take a little bit of a step back when you are going through an awakening on it you are becoming conscious you're taking it out Mm -hmm. of your subconscious mind into your conscious mind and then you're starting to control the narrative of what's going on and stopping the endless chatter because there's a lot yeah. of and I can literally see you do it you start to move around a lot more and I think oh my god here we go here we go <laughs> there's gonna be eyes are rolling it, in the back it, of the head <laughs> yeah. and you know the thoughts that you have aren't thoughts they're not truths they're just habits so it's mm. a default habit and habits can gradually be broken I do not overthink things um the only time I do, which is proved how it works, is when it involves the children okay. because I am fearful of their mm. safety. So I'm not fearful of mine ever. I'm fearful of theirs. So, but even then I've stepped back, particularly during teenage years, you cannot overthink anything because you're muddling with them. So I quite like a bit of spontaneity. And sometimes mm. I like the 15 minute rule. I'm just going to think about what's happening in the next 15 minutes and then I won't be overwhelmed because I'm slightly vibrating on a slightly different level from you. So <laughs> how do you think you are going to deal with this what is your well I think the plan okay so first of all I hadn't connected it to fear but obviously that is what it is so I'm fearful that I will make a mistake not control yeah fear fear. I'm fearful with say a work scenario that I'm not well informed enough that I'm not prepared enough but you know after 30 years of doing this yeah I know I always I can do it history would prove from a factual logical point of view you are always prepared you've done very well so I think that the fear I like your 15 minute thing of I'm only going to allow myself to you know do this for 15 minutes because I can find like an hour's gone and I'm like oh my god I've just spent an hour just yeah. researching that extra thing or whatever that does, I really didn't need to do but something else actually that aside from your fabulous advice that has been helping me is a book by Deepak Chopra actually called yeah. Total Meditation Practices in Living the Awakened Life and I've been listening to it as an audio book I'm actually going to have to buy a physical copy too because I just think I'm going to keep returning to it and there's little exercises and things that you can do it's like a little manual for life so I'm definitely going to buy that you mentioned mantras I've got from from it or something that I did write down when I was listening to it is you have to live in the moment with clarity of purpose you have to allow life to unfold without knowing what the future holds and you have to trust at some level consciousness is taking you in the right direction and I think that really answers my kind of overthinking situation. Can you do it though, Trish? I'm going to try. Shall we test it? I can only try. Yes, we will. I'm going to give you a task. (laughs) If it takes you over six minutes to do, then we're going to start again, aren't we? We're going to stop. Yeah, exactly. Trish, we're here at my favourite bit. Let's do some midsummer nostalgia noodling take me mm-hmm. back come on okay well i'm going back to the 70s some of you may not have been born then <laughs> some of you will have but you may remember the slimming breads do you remember nimble and slimpsia oh my goodness <laughs> i do remember nimble they just I were think, smaller slices weren't they well i think that's it i think the thing about it the reason why it popped up was that it was that summer thing wasn't it it's like you know yeah. always you had the ads in the summer and um and it just seemed to be that awful white bread that was just I think that literally was just a bit smaller or something but the adverts were the things that got me because nimble I don't know if you remember this and I did have to remind yeah. myself I had a vague recollection of it a woman in a smart yellow trouser suit with a matching beret being lifted by a hot air balloon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do the soundtrack of she flies like a bird da, da, da. so the idea being oh, good some singing some, some trish. singing trish singing we haven't had any french this week so we thought we'd have no. a bit of singing instead um yes with nimble written on the balloon so the idea being obviously if you 
eat this oh, nimble bread. Just terrible. No, how did we come oh, out of the seventies alive with any body what? image? I, it makes me realise that we're probably the first generation that was born with a constant feed of these messages because yeah, telling this us actually we were started wrong. in the late sixties. You won't guess who was in one of the early adverts for it. Joanna Lumley, a young Joanna really? Lumley, oh black and white advert, her on a picnic rug in a bikini, eating sandwiches, and it's then just jumping in a river. And telling being, us all the time, oh, if we were smaller, we would be more acceptable yes. in society. If exactly. we were a certain way, everything would be better, we'd be happier, we'd be everything. I'm, we must have quite a strong mindset to have escaped that, I think I so. But I, what, what way me sort of like laugh about it thinking about it as I said no nutritional knowledge back then so I think a lot of people just thought well if I eat a pack of that it's going to make me slim (laughs) what like my teenagers I'll just eat the whole packet I'll eat the whole packet and then I'll just leave the empty packet on the table yeah Yeah. we we didn't know we didn't know anyway where have you been well I was thinking about what I used to do on Saturdays with my friends in the 80s oh yes the late 80s what naughtiness did you get up to no not that I can't disclose that (laughs) on on the podcast, I was remembering the bright lights of the communal changing room. <laughs> what? Do you remember? In the oh, 80s, in the there were no pool. individual changing rooms. No, in shops. Oh, in shops? Yeah. Oh. So when we would go to CNA and oh, Topshop and Miss Horror. Selfridge, we would go as a gang to mm. try clothes on. That was an actual activity. Yeah, not buying any, because no, didn't have any money. No, didn't have any money. We'd go together as a group and just sort of stand there in our bra and pants trying oh, clothes God. on. Can you remember that? That's when we didn't have smartphones. Mm. There was no, no Netflix. Mm. We had to go out and make our own entertainment and suddenly rampaging up and down the high street, trying on clothes. Trying and on. I was looking at it thinking... Gosh, does everyone else remember that? And then I saw a huge thread on it on Mum's Net. And one of the ladies had been in Miss Selfridge and apparently the shop staff used to come in every 20 minutes and spray air freshener around and go, oh. no offence, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Much offence taken. Much oh. offence taken. Hmm. Thank God that's not the group activity yes. of our I teenagers just think now. changing rooms in general just... I don't remember the last time I went in one. It's just... Oh, well, I'm in the Lido, aren't I? Of a, a oh, yeah. Lot. I mean, trying on changing clothes. for me. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about the trying... The, the horror of trying on yeah. clothes. But I think we'll leave that to another, another yes. episode. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Postcards from Midlife. Thanks all of you for listening if you enjoyed it please tell your friends and all the midlife women you know and remember to subscribe on your podcast provider and rate and review us too if you would it's always really helpful for our listener numbers if you can download your episodes as well and you can also join us every day if you like on our private facebook group on instagram or have a look at our website postcardsfrommidlife.com or email us at hello at postcardsfrommidlife.com goodbye bye